Edge AI is a new buzzword in the tech world. I want to figure out if it's truly going to revolutionize and change our lives like all the marketing hype would have you believe, or if it's just another passing fad. To do that, we first need to figure out what it means. Throughout the 1940s and 50s, researchers began discussing the possibility of creating an artificial brain. At the 1956 Dartmouth Conference, which included the likes of Nathan Rochester and Claude Shannon, the organizers postulated that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. John McCarthy suggested artificial intelligence as the name for this new field of research, and it stuck. McCarthy claimed that artificial intelligence is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. By that broad definition, almost any computer program that makes decisions can be considered AI, even if it's just a collection of if-else statements. For example, you might consider a thermostat that turns on an air conditioner if it gets too hot as a form of AI. Most people consider AI as mimicking human thought, which is where we get to this idea of machine learning. In the 1950s, AI researcher Arthur Samuel developed a number of algorithms to teach a computer to play checkers better than he could. He had it play thousands of games against itself and learn the best moves. All this work led Samuel to publish a paper where he coined the term machine learning. Many years later, Professor Tom Mitchell wrote in his textbook, a computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some class of tasks T and performance measure P. If its performance at tasks in T, as measured by P, improves with experience E. In other words, machine learning is an application of computer algorithms that get better at some task or function based on previous attempts at that task. In essence, it's a computer program that learns from experience, much like humans and animals do. From this, we can see that machine learning is a sort of subset of artificial intelligence. All machine learning algorithms can be considered AI, but not all AI algorithms can be considered machine learning. While there are many machine learning algorithms out there, one that's getting lots of attention recently is the neural network, which is modeled after how the human brain works. Each of these circles represents a node or neuron, which performs some math on its inputs and returns an output. The input layer of nodes might take in samples from something like words in an email or pixels in an image. The output from these nodes are fed to one or more layers, known as hidden layers, which are then fed to an output layer. In this example, our output layer only has one node. We might be interested in knowing if the words in our email indicate that the email is spam or that the image is a cat. The output node might give us a 1 for spam or cat and a 0 otherwise. We can have more output nodes if we want to classify more than one thing. To train a neural network, we assign a number of weights to each of these connections. Whenever a node produces an output, which is just a number, it is then multiplied by that weight before being fed into the next node. So we might feed pixels into the input layer and all those weights determine the ultimate output. If the model was wrong at guessing if the image was a cat, we would penalize it and the training algorithm would adjust the weights and try again. We do this hundreds or thousands of times until the model can successfully guess that our image is a cat. At that point, we have a fully trained neural network. Most machine learning models work like this. A model is just a collection of numbers, weights in the case of our neural network, and which math operations we should perform. We run one or more algorithms to train the model, that is, we adjust the numbers that make up the model until the output of the model is giving us what we expect. You'll often see this model represented as function h of x, which is known as a predictor function or hypothesis. We can then feed new input to this function, which the model has never seen during training, and it will perform all that math with the trained weights to give us an output. If we did a good job of training the model, it will produce an output that should, in theory, be close to reality. For example, we give it a new photo, and it should be able to tell us if there's a cat in it or not. The idea of adding more than one hidden layer to these models is not really new. It's been around since the 60s. Adding more layers will often help with accuracy, but it becomes vastly more computationally intensive with each layer added. Researcher Rena Dechter introduced the term deep learning in her 1986 paper to describe similar added complexity and depth in other machine learning models. As a result, we arrive at this notion that deep learning is a subset of machine learning. 
For many years, deep learning remained in the fringes, locked away in universities and research centers. That is, until Google Brain. Google Brain is a research team formed in the early 2010s to work on making deep learning more accessible. In 2012, they made a big splash by showing they could train a rather complex neural network to recognize images of a cat. They did this by feeding it millions of images found on YouTube videos. Around the same time, we saw the rise of graphics cards being used for machine learning. While a CPU core is optimized to perform one operation on one or two pieces of data very quickly, a graphics card is capable of performing one operation across thousands or millions of pieces of data at the same time. This is how they update images on your monitor so quickly. As it turns out, this is super useful for performing matrix operations found in many machine learning algorithms. We're now starting to see custom circuits being designed in FPGAs and ASICs to perform these algorithms even more efficiently. Thanks to these efforts to make deep learning more useful, we're now seeing an explosion of machine learning in many different fields, from robotics to medical devices to marketing. People are realizing that you can throw machine learning algorithms at data to discover patterns. Facial recognition is one common example, but many social media platforms are now using machine learning to figure out which posts to show you to keep you engaged more. And it's working. After about 2012, the popular buzzword became big data. As companies started to realize they could apply machine learning algorithms to help grow their businesses, they wanted to get their hands on every piece of data imaginable. For example, collecting the browsing habits of thousands of users required large amounts of data, terabytes potentially, to be stored on servers. You might need to then transfer all this data to a separate server if you want to run machine learning algorithms to predict what users will search for or buy next. This gave rise to the notion of collecting, storing, and managing big data. That should hopefully give you an overview of what machine learning is and an idea of what this notion of deep learning is. There's one more thing to throw into this mix, and that's the Internet of Things. Yes, the buzzword that you couldn't stop hearing about in 2016 and 2017. Connecting embedded systems to the Internet is not really a new concept, as demonstrated by the famous Coke machine at Carnegie Mellon in 1982. By some forecasts, we're supposed to have 30 billion Internet-connected devices next year. I think a connected drill is a bit silly, but IoT is proving to be very useful in things like industrial automation, where things like robots and sensors can remotely report potential problems before they occur, possibly saving companies millions in costly repairs. But once again, we run into the problem of having to collect, transport, and analyze all that data. Let's say you've got some internet-connected sensors in your warehouse. These are sending gobs and gobs of data back to some servers across the internet where you're running some fancy machine learning algorithms to try and predict throughput, maintenance needs, and whatever else. All these meaningful statistics are then sent to a dashboard on your personal computer where you can determine which actions to take next from the comfort of your office or home. This is one example of this idea of cloud computing. However, as you begin to scale up operations in your warehouse, you might start to run into physical limitations in your network bandwidth. Wi-Fi might get too crowded with all those sensors, or you might start having to pay way more than you intended to your internet service provider for extra bandwidth. That's where we get to this idea of edge computing, where you run your own local computers or servers to help manage all that data. These servers don't exist out in the cloud. You likely own or have control of them, so they're said to be on the edge of the cloud. They may not be as powerful as the remote servers, but they can help alleviate some of the bandwidth requirements. These servers can collect, organize, and do some basic analysis of your data before shipping it off to the remote server. Here's where the fun begins. If we start running machine learning algorithms on that local server, we've entered into the realm of edge AI. Even if the algorithms aren't as accurate or as fast as they would be on a remote server, they still might be more useful being closer to the collection devices rather than having to rely on the internet and all of its latency. And it gets even more interesting when we start running machine learning algorithms on the collection devices themselves. Assuming the processing power is there, we can do some basic data analysis and curation before sending it off to our servers. If you're looking for a more familiar example of Edge AI, just reach for your nearest smart speaker. These have a pre-programmed model that listens for a wake word or phrase. Once it hears that word, it then begins streaming your voice to a server across the internet where the whole request is processed remotely. Alexa, what's the weather like outside?
Right now in Jefferson Heights, it's 79 degrees Fahrenheit with cloudy skies. Today's forecast has thunderstorms with a high of 83 degrees and a low of 75 degrees. Over the next few episodes, I'm going to explore a few of the Edge AI packages that are out there. I'll be honest, I don't know a whole lot about machine learning, but I think it'll be fun to tinker with them. Which package to use is usually the first question. Here is a business survey from 2018 on the popular machine learning packages. Scikit-learn is particularly popular. It's an open source Python package that's a great introduction to machine learning. It boxes up many of the popular machine learning algorithms for you to try out. However, it's not really optimized for parallel computing on GPUs, so it's generally not considered to be great for production. TensorFlow is the next most popular. From my understanding, it requires a good bit more knowledge about machine learning to use it. Think of it like the building blocks that you can use to construct efficient algorithms. It is open source and was developed by the Google Brain team. Keras is another popular framework, but it mostly acts as a wrapper that makes some of the other libraries, like TensorFlow, easier to use. There are others that are definitely worth checking out, but these three seem to be more popular. Specifically, I'd like to look into getting started with the NVIDIA Jetson Nano, as well as running TensorFlow Lite on something like an STM32. This idea of running machine learning algorithms on such small embedded devices is still somewhat new. I'm curious to see where it goes, so see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.